wouldn't let that pass without giving him a call and saying, well, I wasn't, I, I eat broccoli, but I really never liked peas. They had like that popping thing in your mouth, and so I was I would kick my peas out for, for a long time. And so we sort of bonded over that. Um, I invited him to come out. Uh, two times he stood me out, the third time he came, and that one took. Um, and so he, he read an article about brain fear about a year and a half ago. And then this uh, past January, he went through the Kickstart program himself. And I'll let him tell you a little bit more about this journey when he talks. So uh, I'm going to turn it over to Baxter, who's going to start off with uh, a presentation. And then we're going to shift to an interview with, uh, with him in court. So please give a warm uh, welcome to, uh, to Baxter. Thank you all for coming out on a Sunday afternoon. What uh, I'm going to do is uh, I have about uh, 1,500 slides I'll get through in about 30 minutes. <laughs> and, uh, and so we'll leave some time for the interview and, and hopefully some questions. Uh, what I'd like to talk about is the food prescription approach to treating disease. And I'm going to focus on congestive heart failure. Uh, um, a number of these slides talk about some of the basic fundamental aspects of heart failure. So excuse some of the basic science stuff, but I'll make sure you clearly understand it. Um, my day job is a clinical assistant professor of medicine. Uh, I'm a cardiologist and cardiac electrophysiologist at the University of Texas Health Science Center in Houston. And my, I like to say, weekend job is to prevent people from needing my day job services. And I work as uh, the director of my Denver Heart Wellness I want to talk about the tale of two cities. In Houston, we have the Texas Medical Center. Here's a picture up top here. Uh, refer to that as the Goliath. So this is the world's largest medical center. It has its own zip code. There are three heart transplant centers. And just four miles south of here, in the shadow of this huge humongous, is David, and this is our center here. And so just to give you a little bit of our perspective, Goliath, the largest medical center in the world, 54 medicine-related institutions, uh, three heart transplant centers, the world's largest tech, uh, children's hospital, $20 billion budget. Here's David, smallest medical center in the world, <laughs> one medical building, over two dozen smoothies sold, and uh, a less than $20 billion budget. So I uh, want to use that comparison as we go through the discussion to give you an idea of how we practice medicine in a traditional manner and how we're trying to do things uh, in the small way that we're doing it. Before I do that, I want to give you um, the beginning of a story. It's always important to apply a clinical scenario to these conditions. So this is a 69-year-old lady that uh, was referred to me early in my career. She was referred because of dizziness and has forgetfulness. And the dizziness, oftentimes, they think it's a cardiac-related issue. Uh, we did a workup, but we found that it was a neurological problem. She had an MRI and was found to have a benign tumor. Uh, the tumor felt, felt to be operable because of her medical history. She had diabetes, had chest discomfort, hypertension, etc. Instead of working up with the distance, we had to clear her for her neurological surgery. So we did the workup. Uh, she was on a number of medications uh, for chronic illnesses. The preop valve revealed, revealed that she had a type, you know, stenosis in one of her main arteries, she had to have a stent, angioplasty. She underwent all that successfully. The tumor was resected successfully, and there we were. We conquered what thought was thought to be cancer and heart disease all in one patient. So we were pounding our chest, and hooray was the, the uh, uh, sound that came from our building. But there's more to this story, and we're going to get to that later. So uh, the standard of treatment. So what is it? How do we treat heart disease? Well, what is heart disease? Oftentimes patients come to me and say, well, you know, doc, do I have heart disease? They say, well, you have high blood pressure. So is that heart disease? You have high cholesterol. Is that heart disease? Uh, you feel palpitation. Is that heart disease? Well, heart disease is an umbrella term, and it's a number of different potential disorders of the, what, cardiovascular system. So it's not just the heart, but the blood vessels that support the circulatory system. So heart disease is really a constellation of things, and any problem that's related to the cardiovascular system is in part, quote unquote, heart disease. Uh, cardiovascular disease may be a better way of describing it. So we have to consider the normal heart function to figure out, okay, what's normal versus what's abnormal. 
So how does the heart work? Well, it beats 100,000 times a day. Uh, that two sides of the heart will meet as cardiologists. We think of the heart as two hearts, the right and the left heart. The right heart is the venous side. The left heart is the arterial side. Uh, blood goes to the right side of the heart, from the right side of the heart to the lungs, where it gets oxygenated. Comes from the lungs back to the left side of the heart. Notice this is red, so it's high oxygenated uh, blood. Then it goes out to the periphery, brain, other organs. Also goes to the heart itself to deliver oxygenated uh, oxygen to tissues. And so that circulatory process goes around and around. And so the heart functions in that way. So this circulatory process enables us to function in a normal way. So if you can imagine your circulation decreasing and brain not getting enough oxygenated blood, guess what? You may become slightly forgetful or maybe have like a little mental fog. So even though we may think heart disease starts with chest pain, heart disease may be a sign of mental fog or forgetfulness it may be a sign of heart disease. Guess what? The heart delivers oxygenated blood to the GI system. Indigestion, loss of appetite could be a sign of congestive heart failure or cardiac dysfunction. So heart disease can manifest in many different ways beyond what we think of as just chest pain or shortness of breath. Uh, the circulatory system, as I said, the heart feeds blood to itself. It has its own electrical system. I, if you saw the other slide of electrophysiology, it deals with the electrical system of the heart. Uh, the quarter arteries, you can have plaque fill up in the arteries, you're all familiar with heart attack. Well, what is a heart attack? It's when a plaque ruptures and a clot forms and sudden shut off of blood flow to the heart muscle and heart muscle tissue dies. You have bowel disease. So each of those chambers, I mentioned the right and left side of the heart, each side has an upper and lower chamber. Each chamber is separated by valves. These valves can become diseased. So if the valve's leaky, they have regurgitation, valves tight, you can be stenotic. So valve disease can also be a part of heart uh, disease. Then you have primary heart muscle diseases. Uh, you have systemic illnesses, so a systemic infection. Uh, an autoimmune disease may indirectly affect the heart. So there's a whole constellation of things that can contribute to heart disease. And so I just want to give you that broad spectrum of what we're dealing with. What is congestive heart failure? It's not a rare problem. Congestive heart failure is the number one cause of morbidity and mortality uh, in the United States. Of all the heart disease, this is the, if you are, uh, if anyone here is a hospital CEO, you know what I'm talking about in terms of heart failure. This is going to be the number one DRG that's causing cost, uh, contributing to your cost as a hospital. We divide heart failure into diastolic and systolic. The terms are not that important. Diastolic is with stiff heart. The heart cannot relax and allow blood to fill. And if it's not allowing an adequate amount of blood to fill, guess what? Adequate amount of blood flow cannot circulate. Systolic is that the heart doesn't contract normally, so it doesn't squeeze enough blood out to circulate. So you have these two forms of uh, heart failure. Ejection fraction, the amount of blood that the heart squeezes out with each contraction. Stroke volume is the amount of blood that's squeezed out, so this is the volume of blood. So your stroke volume would be 500 mLs or a liter. If you have to circulate a liter of blood around uh, each minute and your heart's only squeezing out 500, then it has to beat twice as fast. So if it can squeeze out more per beat, then the heart doesn't have to beat as fast, and so the circulation is more sufficient, efficient. There's vast resistance, that's how tight your blood vessels are. If the heart has to circulate blood through very tight blood vessels, then it doesn't get across, the heart's under a lot of stress, and then cardiac output is the total circulation. Now, you're gonna have a test over this at the end of the talk, so I want you to take a picture of this slide because we're gonna go over this. But I went through these details for a purpose, so this is not meant to be a cardiac physiology uh, lecture, but unfortunately it is for this that slide. This is not uh, a rare disease, 5.7 million adults, um, one in nine deaths in 2009, it's probably gone up since then, $30.7 billion each year, so it's a very expensive disease to deal with. So how does Goliath deal with heart failure? Well, Goliath has a lot of pills, nice pretty colors. <laughs> And a lot of variety of pills. Uh, there's probably been hundreds of pills, different types of medications designed for heart failure since I left my training. Okay, and more pills are designed and designed. But despite 
more technology and more pills, the heart failure continues to get worse, okay? Um, you can also have, if you have blocked arteries, you can have angioplasty, or you can have open heart surgery. They put a saw through your chest, anyone's had open heart surgery, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, and you can bypass the uh, blockages. If you have severe heart failure, uh, you may need an implantable defibrillator. Someone like an electrophysiologist like myself, and someone has heart failure, you may have a family member. I'm sure someone here has a family member or knows someone has congestive heart failure who has an implantable defibrillator in, the, in their heart. Uh, you can have an external defibrillator. Uh, if you are near the transplant list, you can have an LVAD. Former Vice President Cheney, uh, you may know, had a heart transplant. Before he had a heart transplant, he had a defibrillator implanted. In fact, with these defibrillators, we have the technology where you can monitor your, your uh, defibrillator activity remotely <coughs> through the, uh, through, the uh, through cyberspace. Uh, he wasn't connected to that. He didn't want someone to intercept his uh, signals <laughs> and uh, cause trouble. He had an LVAD, and he also went to the transplant. And so he progressed this whole process of uh, heart treatment. So there, uh, in Houston, by the way, we have three heart transplant centers in walking distance. I think I mentioned that earlier. Uh, transplant is a very expensive uh, procedure. People can uh, go to transplant this. They're sick. Oftentimes, they're in the hospital for six months sometimes. And so uh, it takes a lot of cost and a lot of resources. But there's a new way to classify disease. So how does David deal with this? Well, David has a little concept of a tree. And if you look at this tree, you have a lot of leaves and branches and a lot of different disease types. So instead of saying heart failure is a separate disease, heart failure is really one of many manifestations of one disease. Now, this main manifestation is poor nutrition. I can put other things here. I can use biochemical and physiological imbalance. But all of it's related to poor nutrition. That's at least the core. There's some other things that feed into it. But the bottom line is that there's one core cause of all of these different diseases. So if we think of disease states that way, then we can say, well, instead of me treating this, 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 and this, maybe if I treat things here, I could be more effective. Because what I can tell you for sure is this. All of our patients who come in with congestive heart failure, they have other things too. Nobody comes in with one thing. Everybody has a list. They all have ticks and fleas. And so <laughs> we have to address everything uniformly. What we do now is we give a pill for this, we give a pill for this, we give a pill for that, and we give a pill for that. And then for all these pills we've given, they all have side effects. So the medication, when I give a medication there, guess what? That medication grows its own branch. That's, that branch is called side effect branch. And so I gotta treat side effect branch. And so you're treating pill, uh, conditions with pills, and then you have to treat the side effects uh, with the pill you use. So the concept is, can food be used to reverse heart failure? What do you think? Yes. Very good. <laughs> so uh, two key mechanisms of disease, inflammation, vascular dysfunction. Inflammation, I like to, to, to think of inflammation as your system being on fire. I don't know if anyone has arthritis, had any other inflammatory condition, but it feels like it's on fire. People have arthritis in the joint, the joint's on fire. So inflammatory conditions can affect anywhere. They can affect the joints, it can affect blood vessels, it can affect cardiac tissue, other organ tissues. But inflammation can be a systemic problem and also a local problem. Vascular dysfunction is another problem that, that uh, contributes to heart disease. So this is a cartoon of a vessel. Plaque builds up in these arteries over a long period of time. Notice that the disease starts in the wall. Inflammatory processes go. Then you have plaque de uh, development here. And then you have plaque rupture. Then you have a heart attack here. And then chronic stenosis over time. All of these lead to progressive deterioration of heart muscle and lead to congestive heart failure. This disease state here starts very early in life. Okay, They've seen atherosclerosis in, uh, in utero. Uh, they see about 65% of kids 14 to 16 have atherosclerosis on autopsy because these people have died from car wrecks. They've done autopsy studies in male soldiers who died from traumatic injury in 1953. About almost 80% of them have gross plaque, average age 22. So by the time you're 
14 to 16, there's a 65% prevalence of coronary disease. By the time you're 22, there's about an 8%. So what do you think the prevalence is by the time you're 30, 40, or 50 years old on the standard American lifestyle? Virtually universal. So it's not a matter of whether you have disease. By the time you're coming in my door, you have disease. It's a matter of what's the, the nature of the disease and how we're going to treat it. So food and inflammation. We can eliminate inflammation with certain foods and we can cause inflammation with other foods. The first step is to remove the foods that cause inflammation. If you have a house that's burning up and the house is on fire and you got some joker in the back spraying gasoline on the fire. Now you can get all the fire trucks in the town to come and try to put the fire out. But I would suggest the first thing to do is to stop spraying gasoline on the fire. That's the food you put in. And I want to emphasize that is because of the following. Anybody can eat a piece of spinach or an avocado or a piece of broccoli every now and then. Even if you choke on it, you can eat it every now and then. <laughs> so the, the, the worst junk food eater in the world probably eats something healthy every now and then. So eating healthy is not the problem. You know what the problem is? Not eating bad food. So when I counsel my patients, have a concept, and I talk about total removal of bad foods. Now I understand that different approaches, sometimes say let's take gradual steps, remove one thing, and I'm, I'm okay with that, except for if you're in my office. <laughs> if you're in my office, you have bad heart disease, then we don't have time for progression and moderation and, and being nice. We have to get to business, okay? So it's not a bite, not a drop, not a crumb. Can y'all say that? Not a bite, not a drop, not a crumb. That's absolute total removal of bad food. If I'm going to implant your defibrillator or pacemaker, do you want my gloves A, 85% sterile, B, 95% sterile, or C, 100% sterile? 100%, right. So if you want that criteria for your surgery, why can't you have that criteria for your nutritional status? It makes sense. I'll tell you why else it makes sense to do that, but we'll go on. So here's some cardiovascular hemodynamics. I went through these, I told you to do a test. The reason why, we're gonna, I'm gonna show you some data where we show changes in this. So the better the ejection fraction, the better the heart function. The better the stroke volume, the better the heart function. The lower the vast resistance, the better the heart function. And the better the cardiac output, the better the heart function. The smaller the heart size, the better the heart function. So bigger is not better in terms of heart size. So what did we do? We did a study. We looked at about 15 adults and we uh, put them through a program. We call it a nutritional boot camp. And uh, they went through the boot camp and they were on raw fruits and vegetables only for about four weeks, about 15 subjects. And we measured these hemodynamic parameters. And what did we see? Vascular resistance went down. So the tightness of the blood vessels decreased. That means the flow was easier to go through their blood. This is only on raw fruits and vegetables only. So that's the therapy. It wasn't a prescription, it wasn't anything else. Look at the cardiac output. It went up significantly, okay? By about 10%. Increase in cardiac output uh, just by raw fruits and vegetables, only four weeks. Increase in stroke volume. Increase in thoracic fluid content, so that means they had higher filling pressure, they're more hydrated, okay? Decrease in heart rate. And overview. So overall, increased stroke volume, decreased fast resistance, increased volume, uh, thoracic volume, decreased heart rate. Decreased systolic and diastolic blood pressure, and of course they lost weight and all that stuff. We didn't care about that. But uh, their cardiac function improved. We did care about the weight loss. I'm just <laughs> <laughs> um, so again, in graphic form, stroke volume, cardiac output, the rest, the good things went up, the heart became smaller and stronger is what this summarizes. We recently published a study with three patients with heart failure, their hearts were beating at 22% on average. And so we put them on a plant-based diet. So these people were congested, they were on transplant list candidates, okay? But instead of giving them a transplant, we said, well, maybe we can improve their own heart's function. So what we did is that we put them on, uh, I got to pick that slide, 
Same nutritional detox. Average ejection fraction, 22%. They had what we call ischemic heart failure, so they had coronary disease related to the heart failure. So we put them on a food classification system, and I'll, I'll answer that question later. But we have a specialized design of classifying food. I don't just say vegan, I don't say raw. I have number system that defines how clean it is. So zero is the cleanest, 10 is the, the least healthy, and we have a numbering system so we can be very precise in terms of how we prescribe food. And uh, I can get into that in the Q&A session. So what happened? The ejection fraction went from 22% to 42%. Now, does the criteria of heart failure, if your heart is being less than 35%, then you need a defibrillator. So they went from needing a defibrillator on average to not needing a defibrillator. Some individuals, there's only one individual whose heart did not go above 35%. He started at 14%, he went to 21%. So everybody improved, it's just that his did not go to normal. Two of the three went to normal. Uh, their uh, ejection fraction improved, stroke volume improved, cardiac output improved. Again, heart got smaller and stronger. Stronger and smaller. That's the, the benefits of the plant-based diet. Here's one of the patients, a 42-year-old lady. She worked in the oil and gas industry and she had gone to a health fair, had some bad numbers and she was a little overweight. She wanted to go and uh, lose weight. Went to see a gastric bypass surgeon. They did an EKG and the EKG was abnormal. So you need to see a cardiologist. She came to see us. And when I talked to her, I was concerned about her having chest discomfort and walk her from sleep. She was pre-diabetic, elevated blood pressures, and she has some shortness of breath and fatigue. Fatigue can often be the only symptom that a person gets. Many women come in just with fatigue alone, no chest pain or anything, just fatigue. And we'll work them up and have a significant cardiac disease. So EKG is abnormal. I did an echocardiogram and EF was between 20 to 25%. Very low ejection fraction. Echo was about, uh, uh, MRI was done. It was found to be 24% on MRI. So I took it to the cath lab and this slide's out of place, so we'll go back to that. Did a coronary angiogram and saw a 90 to 95% lesion here. And so the MRI showed a heart beating weakly. I'm going to go back to the MRI. After about five and a half months of the detox program, the what? lesion went from 95% to gone. So she had uh, regression of her stenosis. We offered her a single vessel bypass because you can't put a stent here because you push your plaque back in the left vein, you kill it. So I pulled off and I talked to my individual colleagues and noticed this is the, le this is the left main vessel, this is the LAD. This is called a widow maker because it's so proximal to this. So this shuts off, you die. So we didn't want to play around with this and so we were going to do a single vessel bypass. She didn't want to do that. We'd already talked to her about doing the plant-based diet before we did the heart cast. She said, well, I want to try that first. So I said, okay, it's up to you, you know? But she did it successfully and noticed not only did this go away, you see this vessel here, see how much bigger this is? This is my catheter right here. So this is almost the same, maybe 10% bigger than the catheter. This is twice the catheter. So the, there was plaque in here that regressed and also these vessels as well. And this is the same angle. Now, the, uh, <coughs> Can you bring that on my screen? I push. Can you? Let's see. Can you bring this up on the laptop or show the uh, MRI? I just can't see it. Uh, I didn't share the screen. Anyway, this uh, there's a video of the MRI that the EF here was 24 percent and. Uh, Bring it Back here in a second, just having a few technical difficulties with the slides. Yep, there it is. Okay, so you see the um, heart here is beating and it's fairly moving, it's actually rocking. And this is the after, 
and you can see it's squeezing in more. So the car camera right here the EF is 24% uh, calculation by ES 3% by calculation. So very significant cardiac function. This went from transplant list to no transplant list. That's just for food. Now, sometimes your patients come in and say, well, I've been eating, I'm 75 years old. I've been eating this food all my life. So you had enough. It's <laughs> <laughs> uh, time to make a change. Um, this patient here took away everybody's excuse. At 101 years old, she came in and she was on about six medications, wanted to detox, and we said, okay, let's do it. And we weaned off more than half of our medication at 101. The oldest patient I planted with a pacemaker is 101. So if I can plant a pacemaker in you know, 101, I can detox at 101. So uh, she did great. That's her just before her uh, three birthday. Her birthday happened to be one day after mine uh, on the month. Now what about that patient I talked about earlier? Can y'all even without the mic? I'm just yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so the patient I talked about earlier, we thought we were heroes, right? We were sent to the meningioma, and she was great, but however, she had some complications. She developed meningitis. Now remember, she was on multiple medications. Post-surgery, uh, we had to do a number of things with medication, about hydrocephalus, we had to put a brain shunt in, which bled. She had a coma, had subsequent seizures, had to put on anticonvulsant medications which caused more neurological problems, um, more seizures, she fell one day, more brain bleeding, prolonged hospitalization, was on a ventilator, uh, she developed abdominal compartment syndrome, had swelling around the heart, one night I had to go in, I was called by the radio in the CCU, her blood pressure was dropping, I had to rush in and you know, stick a needle in her chest and drain the blood, um, and I just, I mean, horrible, horrible, foot drain around the heart, et cetera, she eventually died after about a year and 10 months of liver failure. Had to do a compartment syndrome, open up and said liver was cirrhosis. Okay? I couldn't quite figure out what was going on after studying this. Um, however, looking at a chart, chronic medication, chronic exposures, anticonvulsants, liver toxicity. Now, one thing her GI doctor never saw was elevation of liver enzymes. But she had liver dysfunction despite liver enzymes not being elevated. I can explain that a little bit later. But that taught me something very special, uh, very important in my career. But the most significant characteristic of this patient is that she was my mother. Aww. So when I was a little kid growing up, you know how your mothers are, they teach you everything, right? They taught me how to spell, taught me how to uh, tell time, read my Latin words, spell it to me, etc. But on her deathbed, she, she used to tell me, I'm going to be your mother to the day I die. And I never knew how profound that statement was. Because on her deathbed, she taught me the most important lesson that I ever learned in medicine. So I say this to say the following. We have to put a face on these illnesses. We have to put a face on this. Whenever I talk to a patient, whenever I talk to a group, I always think of my mother in terms of what she would tell me. When I was a little kid uh, pitching Little League Baseball, she's the loudest one in the stand. Throw strikes back to Bill, we throw strikes. So every time I walk into the clinic and every time I walk before a group and I try to convey people to do the right thing, I hear my mother saying, throw strikes back to Bill, throw strikes. The number one treatment is the meal plate. That's the number one diagnostic and therapeutic treatment of the future. Thank you very much for your attention. So we're going to do a bit of a transition. I'm going to ask back, Baxter to come over. And uh, you may not want to sit as close to Portland as I do. We'll get the manly distance So Port Portland is, thank you, uh, Baxter. Um, Portland has been working in the Washington Post since 1975, and um, he's a mainstay. I think if, if you're a reader of the Washington Post, he's got the uh, the Metro column that I've always enjoyed reading, and um, yeah, I'm thrilled that he could come here and um, have this this interview with Baxter. We had a unique opportunity uh, yesterday with um, Eric Williams, is the uh, Brooklyn Borough President. 
uh, has done a lot of really great things in the New York uh, uh, system with respect to food. They've decreased the amount of meat that the state is buying by 50%. Um, he's gotten plant-based meals in the Bellevue Hospital, and he's actually running for uh, New York City Mayor. Um, and so uh, uh, Portland interviewed um, Eric, and hopefully we'll have an article coming out about that. And Baxter was able to um, join us for the interview, and it's very fascinating, I think, just to watch that interchange. So uh, when Baxter agreed to come here, I suggested maybe people would enjoy um, listening to the, to the interchange. So I appreciate um, this opportunity to, to share that. So um, Portland, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, let's see, there's a, a microphone right behind you. I'm gonna turn it over to you guys and okay. let y'all talk. Very good. Well, thank you all for coming. Can everybody hear me? Is yeah. this coming through the mic? Or is it? Yeah. It is? Okay. All right. I'm going to put it closer? Or? Yeah. All right. Or yell. Yeah. 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 I may have to yell because I do move my hands a lot. Thank you all for, for being here. I'm six months into uh, plant-based. Um, don't use blood pressure medicine anymore. Um, dropped about 40 pounds. Probably more, but I don't want to get ahead of myself. I don't want to, to bring out the uh, the pants, you know, <laughs> and then end up wearing them again. <laughs> which, which is what is interesting to me now. Once you do this, how do you keep? How do you keep at it? And little little things. One of the things though is community. Just knowing other people who are doing it, and um, uh, people who are pioneered uh, ahead. You've been at this. 15, 15, 16 years. 15, 16 years. It's, it's amazing. And I had known virtually nothing about it. The latest thing that I've heard that has inspired me, and the little things about how we were talking about raw foods. You noticed that when he was talking about all the, the tremendous benefits that the uh, recovering heart had, it was all about what happened after raw food. Raw food. Tell me about that spinach. What, when you put a, a raw piece of spinach, under a certain camera, what do you tell me? Tell me about that again. That's just amazing to me. Yeah, we were we were talking earlier. So the, the foods, first of all, conceptually speaking, we all know that the less processed our foods are, the better. So you know, we, in, in terms of not splitting hairs, we all know if we took you know a piece of broccoli out of the garden not and broccoli, ate it, spinach, spinach. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not there yet. <laughs> If you take a piece of spinach out of the garden and ate it as is, it has one health characteristic. If you take that same piece of spinach out of the garden, deep fried, batter it, batter it, deep fried for about six hours, and then eat it, it would probably not be as healthy as this spinach out of the garden. Now there's some in between which we can discuss, but just looking at those two ends of the spectrum, we know that the less processed the food is, the better. So the concept of raw uh, I like to kind of put quotation marks around and say it's the concept of minimally processing the food. Uh, and, and so we can go into many different iterations of that, but when we consume foods in its natural state, it's close to natural, it has a natural charge to it. Natural and, and, charge? Yes. No, literally. Take the camera, put the camera on it, yeah. and you see it. You have Kurgan and electricity cameras. coming you see out electricity of it. On, on it really raw is. foods versus if you cook it or over process it. It has some effect. It still has some energy, but it has much more energy in the natural state. Now, so we emphasize that for our sicker patients because we want to give them a, a higher charge faster. So when I sit with my patients, they, and now these people are coming to eat barbecue, and you know, you, you, you know we eat down in Texas probably, if you've been there or whatever, heard of it. Uh, chicken, barbecue, all the bad stuff. And they sit in front of me and say, raw fruits and vegetables only, not a bite, not a drop, not a crumb. Uh, some people have to be resuscitated. <laughs> so uh, so it, it's a it's a it's quite a jump, but we work them through the process. So, yeah. But the, the whole idea, and this is for me, the whole idea that you can see electricity, but the photosynthesis, the energy from the sun, can be seen in the plant raw, and you put it in your mouth, and then it continues this process of bringing bringing the sun internally. Yeah. And this is what I'm trying to focus on, is looking at what goes on inside. You see that the heart beats 100,000 times 
a day and it goes through how many miles of veins and we spend so much time looking at the outside of us but it is that inside where real life occurs that's right that's right yeah. and, and and nourishment should be I mean, we think of nourishment in terms of okay how much protein you know right how many <laughs> carbs and, but nourishment should be thought of conceptually as when you take your cell phone and plug it to the charger so it's charging our system. So it's not only just the macromolecules and micronutrients and phytonutrients, all of which are very important, but food has multiple dimensions beyond just the macronutrients and things that we can measure. And so there's an energy to food, or there should be an energy to food, that goes into our system and enhances our Well, that was, I mean, that's the thing for me today. I will always think of looking for the electrical charge in a Spinach, maybe broccoli one day. But here's the other thing, here's the other thing that's been hit me today, and that is um, about your, your mother. My mother, oh, who did the exact same thing um, in raising us, she had a heart attack and I had to stand foot in and all the, well, maybe it was um, a new vein or something. I'm not even sure what the process was because I find it, I find all the surgery stuff. Uh, but the fact that uh, my sisters and I were wondering if we had done anything that broke her heart because we look at you know, how much when a mother suffers you know for something she done so much for everybody and wondered whether it was the stress of raising the children whether it was um, you know wor worrying about about us I don't know but the fact that your mother, my mother, and then you look at the statistics, more women, you know, more African American women. Uh, what is going on with, with women and, and the heart uh, that makes uh, the mortality rate from cardiovascular disease so high? I mean, there are multiple factors, obviously. You know, our body is a very complex um, physiological, biochemical machine, if you will. And there are a lot of things that go into maintaining the body. The body is very resilient. Um, at the top of the list in terms of what happens to us in a harmful way are the foods that we do eat that are harmful and the foods that we do not eat that are not harmful. But do women eat more harmful foods? Is that what it is? Well, it's, it's not just that. But then, you know, there are other things, factors in life. There's stress, you know, childbearing, child rearing, uh, various other things in terms of, you know, stress in the home. So there are many different types of uh, things that the body, that the person is experiencing in their life that has an impact on their function. Uh, excessive stress can have uh, an excessive, uh, can, can cause adrenal insufficiency. So the adrenal gland, which is pumping out stress hormones on a regular basis, gets worn out. So people who are working long hours or worrying about kids who are out after hours. Now I've got four kids Three are technical adults, not but technical adults. <laughs> uh, one's in high school. And so my son's in Europe right now, and you know, he's about seven hours ahead. So, you know, he's up, I'm at, up at night on the phone with him. One night he says, My car got declined, and I may have to sleep in the train station for what? And so these types of things, you know, mothers deal with, parents deal with. So you deal with the stress of that. Uh, if you're not taking care of yourself, the other aspects work. So there are many factors that come into play. And if you're busy doing these things, you're not exercising, you're not meditating, you're not you know, doing your grounding and doing all these wonderful things that should nourish the body and enhance the body. So the system breaks down. Do you have a different message for women when you come into the sacred it's, it's It's not so much a different message, but what I do is I convey to them the issues that they're dealing with and why you know those life issues they're dealing with may have a greater impact on them than someone else. I mean, if, if, if there's a husband who may have a spouse who's supporting them, then his mother tends to be the caretaker of the whole family. And so she's gonna be stressing over things. So the message to her would be, okay, look, you're doing all of these things. I want you to focus on you at this point, and these are the things you're gonna carry out. Okay. Well, I'll give people a chance to ask follow up on it, but it's just interesting uh, to me. The whole idea of the uh, the, uh, the premature um, mortality rate, uh, 
in a country that um, has all this technological stuff, but then the, the answer to the to the problem is, is in a plate uh, that you can actually cut the mortality rate with urban gardening or just uh, going to farmers markets. What's the um, what makes it so difficult with the solution right there in front of us? Yeah, we as physicians, and and, and I won't, don't want to be critical of my profession, but. In, in many ways, we're indoctrinated. I say we're somewhere between trained and indoctrinated. If you look at you know, the, the spectrum of, of learning, uh, one aspect of learning is, is uh, the aspect of, of creative thought, independent thought, you know, uh, like you looking out on the horizon and solving problems, criticizing things, analyzing data. So being able to analyze, think analytically, et cetera, that's one level of education. The next level of education would be training, okay? Here's how you do this, and then you just follow those steps. Then maybe below that is indoctrination. It's that level of training to where then you say, okay, there's nothing else. Just do this and only this. And unfortunately, our medical or professional training in general, and medical training, is somewhere between training and indoctrination. You know, we're saying, okay, you have to give the pills, all the procedures, and this is the standard, and there's really nothing else. And unfortunately, we don't look outside. And even when patients who come in and they talk to their doctors and they say, well, look, I'm off all of my medications and this is what I did. So, well, whatever you did, keep doing it. Let's say, well, if a patient comes to me and says, look, and they had all these diseases and say, well, I'm off my medication because of something I'm doing. I'm just, like I say, just keep doing it. I'm going to say, look, sit down here and write this down. I want to figure out what you're doing. So we, we, we sometimes in our busy lives and busy training, uh, and our development of our expertise, we lose sight of the ability to step out and ask questions outside of what we're being trained to do. Great. And one other thing is, you know, how do you get people to make the changes uh, when they're not in distress? You know, yeah. People may be more willing to make a change when something is going really bad, um, but what, what do you do before that? Yeah. Uh, Many of our patients who come to see us are not in distress. Many of them have early signs of disease. They may have a little bit of high blood pressure, a little bit of cholesterol. And I use the same approach with those patients as I do with the patients who are in distress. It's all about value proposition. We, we go through the process of value proposition on, if not a, a, a daily basis, a weekly basis. Uh, if you're gonna buy a new car, you're gonna evaluate Okay, what do I want in a car and how much I'm gonna pay? Well, car A is $40,000, car B is $60,000. Well, A, I get this and B, I get that. Well, do I want this enough for another $20,000? So you go through a process of value proposition. What is it worth to me? Okay, uh, we do things for our kids and so on and so forth. So I also try to do the same thing with people's lives. So someone comes in, maybe they are a father of three, they're 50 years old, a little bit of elevated blood pressure, cholesterol is up, and they hadn't had a heart attack, et cetera. And I say, well, I can put you on these pills, or we can do a nutritional detox, et cetera. Hey, doc, look, I, you know, this is not, so wait a minute. What are your three daughters worth to you? Because with this condition, in five years, I may be having a different conversation about possibly having a stroke, possibly having you know, a heart attack, possibly heart failure. Now, in 10 years, we may be talking about a defibrillator, heart transplant. Your daughters will not have graduated high school by then. What is the value of your daughters to you at this point in time? So then it, it puts that whole thing in a different light, okay? And then I say, okay, I'll tell you what, this seems like a daunting task, but just give me four weeks. So I don't have them try to make that decision for the rest of their lives. You mean I can't have bacon the rest of my life? I don't know about the rest of your life. Just give me four weeks. Let's deal with four weeks. I want you to do raw fruits and vegetables. Now raw seems extreme, but I'll tell you why it's good. It's good because the first day is very hard, second day is very hard, third day is very hard, and you're mad at everybody, etc. <laughs> but you get through that first week, get through the detox reactions, and we see you, we see you within that first week. You get another sermon on week seven. Get back to the office, how are you doing, 100%? Yes, great. So then, next week is coming up. 
what's starting to happen within week one, or week one and a half, they're feeling great results. Cutting the medications, they're feeling better, more energetic. You know I'm craving fried chicken, but I'm feeling better. And we get into the next week, the next week, the next week. So even though they're not in distress, what they don't realize is how good they don't feel. And that's one. Two, I say, look, for four weeks you can try anything, and all of these other things are potentially beneficial. Your daughter's life and well-being, your spouse, your potential grandchildren, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So then they get to the end of four weeks, and they're feeling like a brand new person. They go from 55 to 18. And so then it's like, okay, now what do you want to do? Well, you know, if I can just eat, because they've been on grass and water for four weeks, right? <laughs> well, you know, if I can just have some beans. Okay, I'll give you a little beans. One serving a week of beans. But do raw for the rest of the time. Okay, great. So you see, the taste buds have changed. They've gone through that whole struggle, and it's made eating a regular, natural, healthy, plant-based diet easier. So we actually have them go beyond the target. If you have a race of a, a 100-yard dash, you run beyond the finish line. You're taught to do that. And so we want them to run beyond the finish line. So I up the ante, and we accelerate the benefits, and we come back, and psychologically, they've made a great improvement. We've had good success with that. My last question is about the ethical vegan and the process by which we <laughs> become. You want to be controversial today, huh? <laughs> no, no, <laughs> ethics, well, okay, only, only in a particular era would okay. ethics be controversial. All right, sure. <laughs> Maybe we're all living in that time. <laughs> so this be controversial. Maybe it's some unethical people in the audience, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no, the, the process, this all seems to be a process uh, that goes beyond the physical. Uh, there's something spiritual about how we, you know, what we consume in the consumer-based society, what, how much, who gets hurt in the process, who gets helped, and um, uh, where do we start? Yeah. And so, you know, so the ethical aspect of, of veganism, as, as I'm sure many of you know, and, and, and I'm sure there are many of you are more uh, expert than I am in terms of environmental issues and animal rights issues, and, and all of these things are very important. Um, I came into this uh, arena from the health perspective. So I wasn't an expert. I mean, I didn't know that. I mean, I learned all this since being in this area, but I didn't know that, you know, the the number one way of decreasing your, your, your you know, uh, carbon footprint is eating a plant-based diet. Uh, but what I did know is that, you know, when I learned it, eating a plant-based diet improved your health. And so I tend to tell people to start with your local environment. Start with the number one environment and the number one animal. The number one animal is you, and the number one environment is your body. Your body is an ecosystem. We, don't, we think of our body as you know, blood vessels and all that stuff, but it's really an ecosystem. There are many bacteria that live around us and in us, and the foods we eat and don't eat affect the kind of bacteria that's around us, and if those bacteria are not the right kind, the right number, our ecosystem's messed up and our health is messed up. So our whole body is an ecosystem, and so we need to start with that number one local ecosystem. Once that is done, then we are in, we're strengthened and empowered uh, and nourished to the adequate to start then work about other animals and the environment uh, uh, abroad. So I think we start with the number one environment, the number one animal. That's the most ethical thing you can do. Why? Because that enables you to then convey energy and love to the uh, surrounding environment. Um, so, uh, opening it up for question, we have two, uh, one, two. I'll let you do it. No, 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 you, no, no, you, no, no, you, you have to answer. Oh, uh, yes, ma'am. <laughs> <laughs> I'm lousy at this. Sure, yeah. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I really enjoyed your, your presentation, especially the David and Goliath uh, uh, analogy. And I guess it struck me, and I realized this a few years ago when I watched the documentary Fed Up, um, which you might be familiar with. But the Goliath is funded by treating disease, That's right. not preventing disease. That's right. So there's no financial motivation for the pharmaceutical or for these you know, thoracic surgeons and all to, to go to the source of what's causing it the way the way you have done and I and, you know what do we do about that because they'll be out of business if right. if we prevent these diseases 
Yeah. Yeah. So to answer the question, what do we do about it? I think we do exactly what you're doing here and now is at uh, the grassroots level. Uh, when I started doing this 15, 16 years ago, I was in Houston and and you know we had the little boot camp classes and that colleagues around they were laughing at me and things like that and not many of them were referring. I have one colleague who's an intervention cardiologist and you know, I asked him to write praise from a book and he wrote you know, Controversial Diet and he wouldn't remove the language. I couldn't use his comment. But uh, we were good friends all the time with church members and all that stuff. Over the years, I'd go to his you know, house, get together, and bring all my raw food. And, and the process over time, he's seeing the evidence with patients that we share and so on. And now he's at a point where he even tried to do a raw detox. Every patient he has that needs a stent or needs bypass, he says you need to go on a plant-based diet. So he's actually been converted. Members of my Sunday school class, I remember I was talking about this, and this guy's crazy, he's extreme. But more than half of them now are eating plant-based. And I'm sure many of you have a similar story. So we do what we're doing, and you do it with the utmost excellence. That's how you, 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 you beat Gila. Because remember, you know, David only had, what, a slingshot and a rock, and, and Goliath had all the power and so the, the presumed power. But, but David had vision and he had determination. And that's what we need to use. We need to use a vision and determination. And just keep in mind, they're still eating dead animal flesh, so that's wearing their minds out. We're eating the natural food, so we're becoming stronger and more fortified. So at the end of the day, the truth will prevail and right will overcome wrong. Just keep doing what you're doing and keep doing it in a, in a steadfast way. Yeah, so thanks for that question. Uh, so we have the food classification system, which we've used in our publications. We have a patent pending. I'm not sure it's going to go through or not, but either way, we're going to use it uh, systematically. And the reason we did that is because we use a lot of labels, and, and there's nothing wrong with labels except there's a lack of precision. And so I decided if I'm going to use this in my medical practice, I have to have a certain amount of precision. One, because I want to be able to reproduce it. So if I say, okay, I put people on a certain diet, then I say, okay, a colleague does it, but if they have used certain differences in the diet, maybe they won't get the same results. So I want to have a certain level of precision in which I prescribe the food. So level zero is raw food that's liquefied. So if you take a carrot and juice it, or, or, or broccoli and juice it, or spinach and juice it, or whatever, then it's liquefied and it's juiced, or make a smoothie out of it, it's, it's, it's a level zero. So that's the highest. Now water is also zero. Blue bean algae that's liquefied is also zero. One through three are raw solid foods. One, low glycemic index. Three, high glycemic index. Two is uh, medium glycemic index. So that's the one to three category. So you got raw, uh, liquid solids, raw solids, and then four is a transition zone. That's 4A, 4B, 4C. 4A is raw high fat content foods. That'd be an avocado, that'd be seeds, uh, some raw nuts, although we don't put nuts in the de uh, detox but we do bring nuts back in during maintenance. Uh, C, excuse me, B are dehydrated foods. So they're dehydrated up to temperature 160 degrees. So you can think of it as sort of low heat uh, temperature foods. Now, uh, that adds texture to food. So we may have, a, we make our own breads, our own chips. These may be dehydrated up to 108 degrees and the like. So it adds some variety to it. Four C is blanched foods. You're adding higher heat, all those wet. Five and six are boiled or steamed at different uh, durations of time. Seven is a no-go zone, but that's when you add so-called clean fish. Uh, eight, you add uh, uh, wild, and well, seven also clean fish and so-called wild animals. Eight, domesticated animals. Nine is when you process domesticated animals that are maybe fried or whatever the case, and 10 is deep fried, processed animals, etc. Now, you can also have plant foods that are also in seven, eight, nine, 10, okay? I mentioned the fried broccoli and fried, a lot of them. You go to vegan restaurants, they have lots of fried foods. And so those are also in the high levels. So notice, if I call something vegan, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's healthy. And so the numbering system will dictate not only what it is and where it comes from, but the numbering system dictates how it's processed and handled over time. So we can replicate that and replicate what we're doing. If we're doing studies, we're trying to have someone else do the same thing. Thanks, Nicole. Does David have a food service? <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> yes. Uh, so, great question. Thanks for that question. So, we have the Garden Kitchen. You can go online, Garden Kitchen Foods, plural.com. I invite you all to Houston, if, and maybe I can sign on the coupon. You come to Houston, come to the Garden Kitchen. Uh, but we have a restaurant on site in our clinic. It's full scale menu, and we do meal plans and detox programs. Uh, we have boot camp classes that teach how to prepare the food, but the, the restaurant is open to the general public as well as to our patients. So when we got into prescribing foods, like putting people on raw fruits and vegetables only, if you're going to do that, and early on we learned the hard way to some extent, is that you're just eating lettuce. You know, lettuce and tomatoes and tomatoes and lettuce. And tomatoes and lettuce and lettuce and tomatoes for four years. And we had people who did that and, and were successful. But we, there were some people who fell off. So we had to create gourmet raw stuff, but we had to do it in a very precise way, in a clean way. <coughs> so what we did is that, okay, people wanted to buy the food from us, so we had to go into the restaurant business. And I learned all about the restaurant business in medical school, right? Uh, but uh, but we, we took that plunge, and, and, and yeah, we had a, a lot of headaches and, and a lot of pitfalls, but we're doing well, and, and we are looking to expand into the grocery business because we think that uh, we need to expand the procurement. So if somebody walks into the healthiest grocery store on the planet, guess what? There are a lot of landmines. A lot of landmines. And so we want to have a grocery store that you go in and you shop, just like in our restaurant. In fact, our restaurant, we publish the effects of our food in our restaurant. So you eat anything in our restaurant, uh, just like here, eat anything, and you're going to get better. We want a grocery store where you can walk in with a blindfold and just pull things off the shelf, put it in your basket, go and eat it, and you'll get better. That's what we need, so that's the next step. <coughs> what is your view of statins and maybe aspirin as secondary prevention? Yeah. So, yeah. So, uh, great question. So, the question, what I think of statins and maybe as a secondary percent, so just to, so that everybody's on the same page, primary prevention is when we try to prevent an event that has not happened. Secondary prevention is when we try to prevent the recurrence of an event that has happened. So, second, an example of primary prevention is somebody comes to my office that you haven't had a heart attack yet, but you had risk for it, so we're going to do something to prevent the first heart attack. Secondary prevention is somebody comes to my office, you've had the heart attack, so we don't want you to have another one, so we need to try to prevent the second one. So second, uh, uh, there is a little bit more of a, of a tricky deal. To answer your question directly, we use aspirin and sometimes use that. It depends on the individual patient. By that, I mean the following. So let's say somebody comes in has had a heart attack, and, and they should already be on the statin and the aspirin if they've been to the you know, hospital, they don't let them go home without it. And if they're not having, this make the case that they're not having side effects, so that's not an issue. So they come in and say, well, I want to do something different. We put on a nutritional detox. We may leave them on that statin during the initial detox, with the cholesterol before and after on the statin and the detox. If the cholesterol levels are really low, then we'll pull them off the statin. Then follow them along. If the numbers stay low, inflammatory markers and all of that, then we'll leave them off the statin chronically. So, and I have a discussion with one of my colleagues, because often physicians say, well, you know, there's a lot of data on statins. And there's a lot of scientific data showing the benefits of statins, lowering LDL. However, all of that data is on people who are eating the standard American diet. There's no data on statins with people eating natural plant-based diet. So what we found is that with our diet, we show a 30% reduction in inflammation, which is thought to be one of the major benefits of statin drugs. In the, the AstraZeneca trial, it took the statin drug two years to reduce inflammation by 37%. We routinely reduce inflammation by 30, 35% in four weeks on a natural plant-based diet. So we know the food is much more powerful. And of course the cholesterol goes down, et cetera. So if I have another therapy that's doing the same thing as a statin drug and it's doing it as fast without the side effects, the statin drugs have the side effects and insulin resistance. So if I can do that without the side effects, then I can bring them off the statin. And we do that carefully. We document their labs, we document their compliance, all of those things to make sure things are working very well. The aspirin, we live on for a little bit longer, and then maybe after a year or two, we may take them off the aspirin. If they had a heart attack, they have a stent, they may be on Plavix or something like that. We have to leave them on that for a year. That's the standard. And then we take them off of that as well. Yes, sir. 
My question has to do with uh, advertising and the way we're indoctrinated. It's almost football season, and they're already starting to show the burger commercials, and we talked about male-female differences. How do you deal with the whole thing of eating meat and steak as masculine? You're a real man. I mean, we have restaurants devoted to eating chicken wings and drinking beer. The whole restaurant, that's the whole idea. Do you have to deal with that when you're dealing with you know, mature men who've been indoctrinated to think that you're not male if you don't eat birds? Well, typically we check the testosterone levels and oftentimes those burgers are having an effect on that. So that's one thing. But, uh, but no, it's a, it's a valid point. I mean, it's, there's a, I mean and, and it's not only just you know, the aspect of, I mean, some people think it's not human. It's not, it's not normal to not eat dead animal flesh. And I describe it as that. I don't call it chicken or fish. I say it's dead animal flesh. It's dead animal flesh or cow pus and, and you know, chicken eggs. And so it, that's what it is. And so um, what we do is we talk to them about the nature of what they're doing to the body. We show it in their labs. And, and we convey you know, the fact that you're only destroying yourself. So you're going to be half a man that you are now in another five years to keep eating the dead animal flesh. And so oftentimes people come in and there's something that triggers their, their need. There's one patient in particular I remember who did a boot camp. Now he's a general, Houston's the barbecue capital of the world, right? Mm -hmm. So this gentleman was uh, the barbecue business. He's had those big traders. He sold barbecue, so that's how he made a living. But then his doctor had to go up on his insulin and he had diabetes and that scared him straight. So he heard about a pro came into the boot camp class. Then four weeks of raw fruits and vegetables. And at the end, he sold his barbecue pit. He turned his life around because it made a big impact. So everybody has that trigger, that, that, that threshold, whatever it is, that gets them to make that change. So you try to leverage those things as well uh, when you do that. Great question. Sure. We seem to be at a point in time where we are hearing more about vegan options in grocery stores, restaurants. Um, people don't laugh as much in schools. What do you think is going on? You know, um, when we look back on this time, we may be smarter than we are now. Uh, it's very possible that we're at a threshold, a tipping point. You know, Malcolm Gladwell talks about the whole concept of tipping point. And when you're in that tipping point, it's hard to actually see it happen. So we may be at the early phase or mid phase of a tipping point with things happen. But see, the market is being influenced by you know, the desire and demand for vegan foods. And so I think part of that is, is a sign of, of, of a, the changing times. Now, one, one thing I want to do is make sure that we, we in the area of the food business, like Gwen, myself, other people, push the whole idea of healthy plant-based food. Okay, so you don't want to, yeah, uh, it, it's really important. So, I, I mean, I love the idea of vegan foods and a great transition foods and the like, but I guarantee you, I can put you on a vegan diet and make you as unhealthy as somebody eating chicken fried steak every day. So you have to be very careful in terms of, of, of how this transition is happening. Because so the naysayers may put a lot of unhealthy vegan food out there and say, oh, see, the vegans are still sick, so go back to eating steak, right? So. <laughs> you talked a little bit about, you talked a little bit about the effect of stress on, on the body and inflammation. I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about that, but also sort of compare the effect of stress to the effect of of, of you know, a bad diet, sort of like how do the two compare? That's a great question actually. So when I got into the plant-based nutrition, we saw people, they said, well, is it stress in the life? Is it stress in the life? And, and, and I didn't put a lot of emphasis on the stress, even though I knew stress was a potential problem. Uh, we emphasized the food, and, and what we saw is the following. So if you get somebody who's in a stressful condition, and, and, and I'm going to use stress now, but I'm going to kind of expand the discussion on mood disorders as well, because I think it's also an important thing. Because we think of diet only in terms of physical components, whether it's weight gain, weight loss, or muscle gain, or whatever. So if someone, let's say they have you know, their mother, their, let's say they're a school teacher in a busy class, or maybe they're a principal and got a lot of stressful job. And so let's say you do nothing to change their stressful environment. 
and they, you know, they in that environment, their blood pressure goes up, etc. They're eating a the regular diet. If you just change their diet alone, not only will they improve physically, but there's a mental and psychological aspect. How they respond to stress will change. So the response to stressful inputs will change where you become more resilient to stress. So there's a physiological aspect of the food that can have a neurological and psychosocial aspect in terms of how you respond to your environment. Having said that, stress in and of itself over a long period of time can have a, 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 a detrimental effect on certain organs, particularly adrenal glands. So a lot of people come with adrenal insufficiency and the like. So let's say your adrenal glands are wiped out. So your mineral uh, metabolism may be impaired, uh, your sleep may be impaired, etc. People with low magnesium, various things. So we may have to target, treat those types of things in addition to putting you on a natural plant-based diet to treat that arc organ dysfunction in addition to that. So there's an example where you have stress that can be affected, that can affect the organ system, that can affect your physiology and biochemistry independent of the nutrition. The nutrition will certainly help because it helps your know, response to stress, but then you may have to do some other things to treat those organs that may be made dysfunctional as a result of stress. So there's a real physiological impact that stress can have on the body. Has everyone heard of the movie The Game Changers coming out? Um, yeah. If you haven't gotten your ticket yet, September 16th, it's going to be out in a thousand theaters around the country, and it's specifically targeting uh, the male role models, so athletes, firefighters, Navy SEALs, special ops. Um, so it's uh, if you want to see the trailer, it's GameChangersMovie.com, um, and it's uh, it's a fantastic, fantastic film. I think that will make a hopefully a huge um, uh, impact on the market. Portland, you want to talk about what was the most challenging part of your your transition? Well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I heard something on NPR, the, this American life is looking at uh, why uh, we're so enamored of uh, all things French and Paris, and uh, of course food was one of the big things, and uh, they had someone who said, you know, in, in, in Paris we, we look at the whole concept of food as medicine, it's just repulsive, you know, we, we eat because food is tasty, it's part of our family traditions, it's our, you know, life like that. And I find that shifting the way I, I, I eat, um, to move away from those things, the cake, the pies, the chip, the snacking, the whole American, the whole thing that's fun to do. Uh, and even the big holiday meals. Um, my eggnog, I love eggnog so much. <laughs> but, uh, but once you break away, you know, and I guess someone has to be first, you know, and for whatever reason, and you look around and there's, there's nobody there. And uh, you just have to hope that, that in any given moment of weakness, that there's not someone around who says, "And eh, you know, just one piece of this coconut walnut cake." You know? <laughs> <laughs> because it sounds like a very loving thing, yeah. you know. Here, take this comforting piece of cake, when in fact it's poison. And the whole idea to make that switch in the head, that you know, what I've been, you know, grown to think of one of the most loving things, you know, ever which is a good, you know, big meal, a seven course meal, steak and stuff, is really just poison. It, it's a joke, and it's hard to keep that uh, in, in mind. Uh, but other ones. Cardiology for kids in college. But otherwise, otherwise, the truth is, Everything else happens in little micro things. There, there are those little yeah. tests. This whole idea of one day at a time becomes yes. really imp important because the challenges will come with a whiff of a, a whiff of something that smells good. And just in that one moment, you know, if you don't let that hook stay with you, you just pass through it. You know, all is well, and you become. I feel like I become stronger. Uh, so it's just getting. It's, it's breaking an addiction. Is what it is. And, and whatever you know, bad habit one 
who wants to break. It's easy to, you know, what, what someone tell me, you know, yeah, I stopped drinking a million times. <laughs> it's easy. <laughs> um, but how to do this and, and stick with it. That, you know. So I, I'm always hesitant about saying what is the toughest time. I, I think that what makes it easier is having a community of people and knowing people you can call and knowing where you can find food, knowing where you can have, where there's, where there's a plan to doing this. Uh, there are some things that you can do. John knows preparing food, Pericles, Gwen, you know, just knowing people who can know what to do to get you over these humps. But also to get you to the point where it becomes really enjoyable because, you know, it doesn't have to be a food as medicine thing. Some of this stuff, really tastes good. I haven't had it with broccoli yet, but <laughs> other stuff is really good. So, that's it. Didn't this lady have a question right here? Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Actually, oh, is that on? Yes. Uh, this is kind of a two-parter. One is technical, and then one is about diet. Um, in your in your talk, you said that the plaque regressed. Does that mean that it was starting to dissolve on its own, or just new plaque wasn't added? Because I, I never, I mean, how did that happen? Yeah. That plaque would be. And then my other one though was about the diet itself, using raw vegetables and stuff like that. I think to myself, oh, that would be easy. But I love salad dressing, so we, and I, I guess that's counterproductive. So can you just address that on, on the, the diet part? Of it? Sure. So the, the regression of plaque, every stage of, when we talk about disease reversal, what, what we want to do is we want to talk about the concept of, um, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to come up kind of conceptually and get right to the point of the plaque regression. And, and, and um, we talk about disease reversal, so it's, well, my diabetes is reversed. So what does that mean? Because, you know, is it gone or is it going away, whatever the case is? Now, I think of disease states as a progression. So you have a scalar quantity, something that has just a value, a number value. But a vector quantity has a number value and a direction. And so you may be at this point in your disease state, and then in five, two years, you're at this point, two more years, you're at this point, two years. So if you're following the standard lifestyle that's not healthy, your disease state is moving in this direction. So then when you start to make changes, that progression in this direction initially halts and then reverses in this direction. So when I think of regression or reversal, I think of reversal of the vector quantity. So the, the re disease is moving this way and then it turns around and moves that way. Now, why did I go into that? Because you may have severe heart failure and you may be way up here moving here. But then we start to reverse it, it comes back and it's here. So after you do your detox, you're here, but your EF still may be abnormal. You still may have other abnormalities, but you're doing better and what? You're moving in the right direction. So there's reversal even though you're not back to what we would consider a normal condition. Now the example I showed you, I mean we all like to show pretty pictures. I can show many other situations where it's much more complex and not as successful. But what I'll say is this. What happened there is you saw a plaque in its early stage. And and uh, plaque, and we've actually shown this scientifically, I don't know if who's ever had acne when you're young, but if you ever had acne before, you know a big, have you heard of those little juicy pimples there? And they're a little juicy and big, and they're about to pop, right? Just before, and if you just sort of bleep them, make Okay. Um, well, they'll finish. Like, maybe it was pre dessert, but they made it to take a dessert. So, that little juicy pimple about the pot is what that lesion was. And so, when you have, and we call that an unstable plaque, and that plaque is, it has a lot of pus in it. And it literally does have pus inside that artery. And it has a thin coat, just like that plaque has a thin amount of skin. And so, that pus can break through almost any minute. So what we did is that when we stopped inflammatory triggers, that pus regressed and that went down. So some of you may have had those juicy pimples, maybe put a little something on it, and it started to go down. That's what happened there. So it was a soft plaque, soft, it had a lot of pus, 
that were addressed once we pulled the inflammatory triggers. And it also had plaque and pus and all the other parts that were not as, as, as easy to see, but those regressed as well. So at that point and stage, that regressed, you were able to see it. Now, what if that was more chronic lesion, lots of calcium and fibrous materials, et cetera, it would take longer for that to regress. So it may stabilize, maybe get a little bit of opening, but not as dramatic. So I showed you, showed you something that was very dramatic. So it just depends on the, the stage of disease as to how much of normalization, instead of saying reversal, normalization. We saw a near normalization there. Uh, I can show you regression or reversal where there's not as much normalization because the disease state is much more advanced. Uh, you asked about the diet. The salad dressing. <laughs> salad dressings are easy. So basically the standard salad dressing has something that's sweet, it has something that's uh, acidic, and it has something that's fat. So basically your fat would be a slither of avocado, you get apple cider vinegar or lime juice. Uh, you add one part water and then get some soaked dates and blend those in your Vitamix. That's your base of your salad. Then you can take herb seasonings or some kind of greens and mix that in there. So that's your salad base all the time. So you can get some uh, pitted dates, keep them so. One part, uh, like four dates, a quarter cup of water, uh, apple cider vinegar, uh, about a quarter of uh, avocado, blend that together and you're good. Don't add ol olive oil in your oil. So that, that's your, and then, so. Baxter, Baxter has a book that I wanted to recommend, The Food Prescription for Better Health. Um, we'll be getting a whole shipment of these tomorrow. Um, we did this kind of last minute, um, so the books didn't catch up, but um, you, you can find this on Amazon, or if you decide to come back to Green Fair, we'll have this um, tomorrow. And he's got a lot of recipes in here that, um, that are great. Thanks, and there's a question there. Yeah, uh, another two quarter to build on what she was discussing. You, know, you mentioned your uh, skeptical interventionalist colleague. How did you get your colleagues to kind of buy in more and more? Oh, uh, you mentioned your uh, skeptical interventionalist colleague. Yeah. How did you get your colleagues to buy in more and more over time? And uh, as a second part, were you able to ever demonstrate uh, regression in any way? Because I think that's something that uh, you know could really get buy in from from a lot of uh, practitioners. Yeah, that's a great question. So again, how do I get my skeptical colleagues to, to buy in? It's, you know, it's really steadfastness. It's, I mean, what we did is that when I started applying this with patients, I was just so overwhelmed with the, the success. I mean, I, I never saw anything like this in my clinical training. But I would put patient after patient. I didn't have boot camp class or restaurant. I was just writing out salad recipes and all this stuff. And say, eat this for seven days and come back. And they, they'd all be better. I said, give me another seven days, another seven. And one lady came in at a wheelchair auction. She put on juice, raw juice for 10 days. She came back walking, talking, no auction. I mean, I was just saying, it's a miracle case, a miracle case, a miracle case. And I was like, wow. Okay. And so I was so overwhelmed with the success of it. And I became possessed. And I said, look, I, I cannot not figure out how to make this work in my practice. And I, it got to, when we was over the restaurant, our, our initial chef quit within a week. I was the chef of the first restaurant. And I'd do my rounds in the morning, and I'd go, and, I, and I'd be in the supermarket shopping. And I, I mean, I was just possessed. And so what I saw was that, okay, let's figure this out. Let's get more and more people. So what happened with those guys, a similar thing. Uh, maybe not as dramatic, but he kept seeing some of my patients come and talk about the success they had. He would send patients over who, oftentimes they have patients who are, we call train wrecks. You do everything you can. They've had the bypass, they have all the medication, they're on 21, 22 medications, they have the side effects of the medication, they're not a bypass candidate, they have all the problems, there's nothing else you can do but send them to Baxter. <laughs> and so, they come, and they go back, no medications, doing backflips, and looking wonderful. And you can't ignore that. Right. And so after a while, it says there's something special about this stuff. And so like I said before, the truth will prevail. The evidence will, will take care of itself. And so when I kept seeing this over and over, I said, look, we just have to make sure we figure out how to create the proper business model, model systematize it, get it to work. It works. We just have to figure out how to 
get the processes to, to implement it in a systematic and organized way. And we're working our way toward that. But that's a great question. Yes, sir. Along the same lines, does your Goliath job still pay for your David job? <laughs> great question. You know, so I get that question a lot. So the issue of does the Goliath job pay for the David job and are you losing money, you're making money, this, that, and the other. It's the insurance re uh, Yeah. So the, the interesting thing is this. We, you know, I started this process. I was, as a done at the time, I was going through a terrible divorce and a lot of crazy things are happening. And, and anybody's run a small business, you know you get ups and downs cycles. So that's, you know, my, my headaches are not any different than anybody else's headaches. So, so <laughs> running a medical practice, we were in a downside and, and we started the restaurant and so on. One thing I realized is that following, uh, uh, by mid part of last year, I stopped doing invasive procedures. So I, I stopped implanting defibrillators and cats and all that stuff, and put full time investment in developing this. And so, I mean, part of me is an emotional thing, and it's, it's kind of tough, but I got through it. But what, what I figured out is the following uh, my accountant used to say, money follows value. So, whenever you're doing something that is of value, it may not seem obvious at the initial point. Our first boot camp, you know, we gave it away almost, you know, and it was, it's, but the point is that once you develop it, the money will follow. And, and, and so that's one thing I always kept my mind and heart on the fact that, okay, this is very powerful, this is very valuable. We just need to keep moving along and making it work. So, but to answer the question directly, we've actually had improvement in our business over time because what happened, because we're so unique in what we do, we get patients from all over the country who fly in, who stay for two months, because, I mean, there are many people with so many illnesses. I mean, this, and, and we've had up to, had a patient with an LVAD on transplant this, we're detoxing him, he's weaning off the LVAD, and we get a lady from Mississippi with drainage of the lung and had bypass and all these other chronic illnesses and lots of meds and her doctors didn't know what else to do. The family brought her in and, and she's been for, you know, 10, there's a, there's a cash side, there's an insurance side. So we do both, and so we created a business model, we, we developed that over time, but the way I think of it is the following. Um, the old way of doing things is not effective, so it is of low value. So over time, money will not pay for it. And we're starting to see that, reimbursements are going down. We get paid only 10% of what we used to get paid for doing uh, invasive procedures that we used to do when I started the training. So we know that these things have you know, limited return in terms of value because you know, I can do a certain procedure, bypass, whatever, and the person comes back, the disease is not gone. Former President Clinton had the same experience. So what's the value of bypass the person who has disease? So I mean, the insurance comes, well, I'm gonna have to pay for something else later, I'm gonna pay you less for this. So value, money follows value, so that's what we focus on, and, and, and so far it's worked. What about yourself? Um, what would you like before, oh, yes, what would you like before you found out about plant-based diet, you eat barbecue instead. <laughs> yeah, we. I I ate just about everything that was good. So again, I was a big eater. So I, at, at the conference yesterday, there were my like, colleagues who talked about the whole adage of you know parents forcing their kids to eat. Mm -hmm. You know that wasn't the case for me. You know, they gave the example of the parent. You know, the, one of my colleagues said, "Well, you sit down, he wouldn't finish his food." And, uh, his mother would say, "Well, Johnny, the." You know, the kid's starving in Africa, and you're not eating all your food. Finish your plate. Me, after I had three plates, my mom says, son, get away from the table. Kids are starving in Africa, eat all that food. <laughs> <laughs> so um, so I, I, I ate all the bad stuff and, and then some. And so uh, I remember one day I was at a family reunion, and one of my relatives made fried chicken, and it was the best fried chicken I had. I mean, I was eating, I ate one thigh and ate another thigh, the third thigh, and I think after about four or five thighs, I lost count. The thighs were actually just going into my mouth, and it was, I was no hand. I mean, I was a big eater. I probably tipped the scale at 300 pounds at some point. I didn't weigh myself regularly. Uh, my LDL cholesterol was around 130, um, and uh, 138, I think. And uh, I had done a number of different diets, and ones that caused me to lose a lot of weight and all that. LDL cholesterol did not improve. Uh, and so, um, but when I got on a plant-based diet, did a, did a juice feast and detox and all that, LDL cholesterol came down between 70 and 80 and it stayed down since. And so, 
Uh, it's made a big impact on my life uh, personally and uh, okay. people around me. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. I, it's, um, I, I always had an interest in health uh, and, and wellness in, in the medical practice. And so that was always in the back of my mind. I didn't know what that meant. And so I read about different things. I was doing my own research on you know, supplements and different diets and so on. Uh, and then one of my patients came in, was on supplements, and it was being treated by an herbalist. I met with her and was introduced to some, you know, whole concept of natural medicine. Then I was dealing with my mom and, and, and that whole experience. So I was being primed for looking for alternative. In fact, my mom, was one episode she was in the hospital, had a severe infection. Uh, but uh, her temperature was like 105 degrees, white town 25,000, and she had a bacterial infection that resisted all the antibiotics in the hospital. And the infectious disease doctor saying, you know, it's a terminal infection, it's nothing we can do. But I learned about colloidal silver. And so I had the nurse that said, okay, give her some colloidal silver through the pet tube. And it wiped out the infection. So that was an early introduction to this. I had not really learned about plant-based foods, et cetera. So it was an evolutionary process of understanding, etc. So after I lost my mom and looked into that, then I ran across an advertisement of a vegan, a raw vegan uh, chef course. So I took a, a certified, I don't know why I did it, I just did it. So I became a certified raw vegan chef. It was a weekend crash course. And in that course, I was exposed to plant-based diet. I was introduced to a local guru, who uh, named is John Rose, who introduced me to juice feasting and cleansing. And this guy knew everything about everything on food. And I'm the first time we met, we talked for four hours straight before we got up to drink a glass of water. And uh, it was just an amazing experience. And so after I had a personal experience and improved my health and started applying with patients, the rest became history. Sugar, salt, fat. Uh, which is the diff most difficult for you? You know, they, over the time, they've all become difficult. Uh, what I did, so when I did the, when I got into this, I did the raw vegan detox and I felt great. So I said, okay, I can eat vegan easy. So I just stayed vegan, but I ate a lot of vegan junk food and you know chips and all this other stuff and you know sugar, salt, fat was those things. But every year I would do a detox, I'd do a cleanse. And after I come to the cleanse, I'm reminded how great I felt on the cleanse versus eating regular food. And so uh, my taste buds over time changed to where I got to where I can experience food in the natural state. What I tend to do, I suggest other people do, let's say for instance you have a sweet tooth and you like sugar. So then what I would say, great, here's what you do. In the morning, get up and consume bitter herbs. Drink bitter tea and bitter herbs. Why? It changes the taste buds. So if you drink a bitter, so like if you need to have uh, something like um, sugar or honey in your tea. I used to drink sugar and honey in my tea. I would just drink a bitter herbs. You know, something that's a blue bean algae, a wheatgrass shot. Just drink something bitter every morning. Uh, I get chewing watercress, uh, dandelion greens, bitter. Chew those things. Bitter herbs on your tongue every morning. That breaks, your, that breaks the sweet tooth. For how long? <laughs> as long as it takes. Wait, wait, now you get to the heart of the matter. People, people, people aren't going to do that. No, but so, so here's the thing. They're not going to do it. But no, here's, here's the thing. It's not so much, don't worry about the rest of your life, first and foremost. So give yourself a five or ten day period of time. So I'll, I'll give an example. So once I was doing a, a juice feast, and when I did these juice feasts, I'd get the sweeter juices. I love the sweeter juices. And so when the drug reps come in, you know, they couldn't bring food. They did about the staff said, look, he's on a juice feast, and you can't talk to him unless you go buy raw juice. You gotta go to this place, get your raw and cold juice. <laughs> so I don't know, one rep may have been annoyed. So she went and got me these green juices, the bitter juices. And so it was all green, kale, no, no apple or anything in it. All bitter. And I didn't like that juice. It's about like two, three quarts. I didn't want to waste it. So I drank it. And, 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 and I affectionately named it the Green Nasty. And so I said, I'm gonna drink another Green Nasty. Do you know after, I don't know, maybe three of those things, it was less than a week, that juice started to taste sweet and creamy on my tongue. Your taste buds change. The biochemistry changed. So how do you address it? You address it head on. If you like sweet, you go bitter, okay? And so it's a bitter and sour, and then it helps change your taste buds. 
and then you don't require the sweet stuff anymore. Yes, sir. Uh, you talked about uh, the ways to kind of disseminate this knowledge and kind of systematize your work. Have you ever done this or considered working with medical students who are still in the process of getting indoctrinated, kind of talked about in their training, uh, to try to uh, well, address it kind of that sure. way? So in terms of dealing with medical students, the question if I've thought about working with medical students who are being indoctrinated, I've thought about it. We have not been uh, given the, uh, no one's approached us to do that. I know some of my colleagues are, are working with medical students. I think Colin Campbell is. I think uh, Michael Greger's done some things in medical schools. So there are a number of people in the plant-based arena who are doing things in medical schools. We just haven't been uh, approached uh, for that, uh, that purpose. But I mean, if we are, then you know, we'd start to consider it. Do you have to wait to be approved? <laughs> well, you know, we, we are so busy working on things. We're like, we're doing, uh, and we're going to be crowdfunding, by the way. I know it's a word from your sponsor. I'm doing a crowdfunding uh, campaign for a heart failure study. We were actually going to do it for our, our, our grocery store, but we, we're planning a bigger heart failure study to show the benefits of this uh, nutritional approach in heart failure. So, I don't know how we can reach you, but maybe it would be nice enough to you know, put you in contact with us when we start the campaign. It'll probably be something to kick off in a few weeks, but if you'd be so kind to come and help support us. So what we're going to do is be raising some of our funding. We get funding coming from other sources, but we want to do a study uh, looking at the benefits of this and heart failure. You're going to do before and after cardiac MRIs. We have one group that will go through the diet. We have a control group. It's really important to do a control group. And uh, uh, we have a, a relationship with Georgia State University. We're going to do biochemical analysis, we do clinical studies, and all. But this may be a very, very important. This will be a very, very important study because the impact that we see, the findings that we see here in the case of the things that we've seen clinically over the years, and we can demonstrate this in the study. Uh, this will actually be published in some of the mainstream cardiology journals or medical journals, and it's something that will have to be, you know, really looked at. And I'll definitely talk to a lot of my colleagues who are in very high places in the area and say this needs to be part of the standard uh, because uh, uh, it's going to be this type of data that's going to have to have an impact uh, in, in the medical community. So, so that's something that we're going to do. So we, we are busy doing a lot of different things. So we're not just waiting to be approached. But some approaches, we'll consider it and, 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 and do something like that. Yes, ma'am. Association rating is, but McDonald has an A minus rating for the American Heart Association. Oh, so, so they, so McDonald's food has an A minus rating. So, if you can explain that, that's the poster child for bad food. And so, well, I said, yeah, and Kentucky Fried Chicken. So, so my, I suspect that not much has changed in that regard. And and you look at American Cancer Association, all these things. You know, it's on the surface they want to control these diseases, but not really. They're in business. I mean, if heart disease go away, the American Heart Association goes away. And so, it's just about you know uh, uh, window dressing, in my opinion. Uh, but I'm not inside. Maybe there's one or two people having some conversations I don't know about, but I'm not aware of it. Yeah. No. Yeah. Well, you can answer the family question. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. What I do know is I have a 12-year-old grandson, and he walks around the house with his, talking to his girlfriend with his cell phone camera on, and he likes to show her the share experiences that way. So everything that's going on in the house, you know, she's looking at, 
And I'm saying that this is just a whole new world. <laughs> this is a thing. Um, but I'm thinking that what they're looking for is a connection. And these are grandkids. I don't know about the middle, middle people, but I'm thinking that this is an opportunity to, to ease in new ways of, of eating, new ways of experience in the world. Because they're everything. They don't seem to be that concerned about um, what grandma is serving so much as look at what grandma is doing. Let's look at grandma's drawers and see what grandma is doing. You know, it's just different. I mean, I think that there are that the family structure, that the social structure, that we're making quantum quantum leaps. We're at these points where we really don't realize how fast things are moving until it's past. You know, uh, we're so far. What do they say that we're, we're making these technological progress? We're, we're, we're gaining, we're moving three times as fast, four times as fast, and it just moves on and on. So who knows? Maybe. Yeah, I have four kids, and, and it, it's a challenge. But but what I, I tell, I have a lot of people approach with the same issue. With the, with the same issue, in a sense that uh, the kids. Uh, they move at different paces. So, like my kids, now, you know, I'm the guru and food Nazi and all that stuff right in the house. And I have to sort of uh, impose economic sanctions sometimes. <laughs> uh, but, um, my, but, but they're different influences, though. So, my son, one summer, he was working at a restaurant uh, between college, between high school and college. And um, there was a young lady who was working there part time, who's you know vegan, and you know he was attracted to her. So he wanted to date her, but you know, but she said she don't date non vegans. <laughs> so I wasn't aware of all this, but you know, I, all of a sudden I'm seeing my son. He's buying all this vegan food. And so, and I say, you know, so what's going on? I mean, I, I've been preaching to him all along, and they're bringing in eggs and steak and sneaking and stuff behind. Him. And all of a sudden he's eating vegan. And so I said, uh, so what's the deal? He said, oh, Tamara says he doesn't date none vegan. And then my youngest daughter, who's influenced by him, then she's eating vegan. Now, she's the biggest junk food eater in the world. And, and so there are different influences that can happen. What I would suggest is the following. Be steadfast and continue to do it. So that's great. They won't come over to the house. Just have 100% plant-based. When they come over, have something you know good that they like. My daughter is 18, had a graduation party. I brought a, a vegan chef uh, out to do a, a whole vegan food. Everybody's worried. What kind of food we gonna have? What kind of food? We gonna have delicious food. Uh, and so we can eat vegan. Uh, I don't know. And it was all vegan. But everybody know who I am. They're all nervous, but they but they came and enjoyed it. Uh, the whole the fam, this extended family. It's all. So be steadfast. Stand your ground. And, and when you have get-togethers over, do it 100% plant-based, and people will be nudged in that direction. Remember, what you're doing is right, and right will prevail. You know, then you remind me of something. When I was doing the Kickstarter, and I bring my food, is this working? Yeah, it's holding hold 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 When I was bringing my food. <laughs> <laughs> my, uh, my 30 year old son would come by and grab food because uh, it was better than, it, he liked it, and he liked the fact that it was already prepared. Yes. He didn't have to cook, but he, he ate it. So that reminds me that um, if people have an opportunity to try it, and it's really about, with the family, I think it's really about the people. People being together, and they will eat, they will find a way to make what's in front of them work for food if you can just get them in front of each other. So. And it's better knowing that they're eating healthy and not eating poison. That is, that is the thing that's so hard to get. And these books are helpful too. Just sometimes the title, How Not to Die. And, and, and you know, Food by Suicide. Or suicide by Food. And that stuff. You know, just hold those up. <laughs> Did you have question? I have a question. It's actually not a question, it's a request. Would you please share your analogy of the bank and the nuns and the thieves? I've used that so many times and I just love it. Some of us have seen too many of my videos. But so, so there's a, I'm going to use that analogy. There's another analogy I like to use. I'm going to say real quickly as well. 
So the whole issue with the, the banks and the fees, and it goes to the concept I mentioned earlier in terms of removing food. So let's say you're running a bank and you have two nuns uh, and two thieves in the bank. And so you go through every day, your drawers are coming up short. And you say, well, my goodness, you know, we need more integrity in the bank. So let's hire more nuns. So you got you know four nuns and two thieves. And you go through that process, your drawers are still short. Then you say, okay, we need more integrity. So get 10 more nuns. You got you know, 14 nuns and two thieves. And go through the process, the drawers are still short. What's the problem? Had to move the thieves. That's the way it is with food. So you can eat all the broccoli, kale, spinach, etc. A little bite, and a little pinch and uh, a baked chicken between the teeth and guns is more than enough to run the blood pressure up, to run the cholesterol up, to run the inflammation up. You've got to remove the feeds in your diet. And so that concept of eating healthier is important. But certainly when, when you get to the point where you're seeing meat, and I'm not taking away from the importance of adding more vegetables and benefit, because people do see benefit. But with my patients, we're dealing, as you mentioned, food addictions. So if you're addicted to something, like we don't tell people in A meetings to drink a sip of uh, tequila every week. We say no because we know there's an addictive factor, so it's the biochemical effects. So even though more fruits and vegetables are healthy, the absolute removal of the poisonous foods and what? The addictive foods is very important as well. Another analogy I've used, you may have seen this, and this is very deep in mind. So uh, Mr. Uh, uh, John, Mr. Jones going to see his physician, and uh, two weeks he's got a vice grip stuck on the thumb. The vice grip stuck, clapped, the thumb is swollen, tender, he sees his physician, visits, takes a complex history, physical exam, looks at the right, the left thumb, the right thumb, and says it's swollen, takes out his prescription pad, right for you know, ibuprofen and codeine, and sends them out, say so come back in two weeks. He comes back in two weeks, says we felt a little bit better, but the thumb is more swollen, and et cetera, we felt a little bit of constipation. So he increased the ibuprofen, increased the codeine, draws some blood works, and it's the seed of codeine and draws the blood work and uh, has to come back in two more weeks, comes back in two more weeks, and he sees that the thumb's a little bit better, but still more swollen and tender. So, and then he looks at the blood work and says, well, your kidney function a little bit off, your liver function off, so we we'll see you to a kidney specialist, see you to a liver specialist, then we'll change your medicine, increase the incense for more pain in the thumb, come back and see me six weeks after you've seen the specialist. While he's waiting to see the specialist, uh, he gets sick acutely, gets rushed to the hospital. He has gangrene of the thumb. The thumb has to be you know, amputated. Uh, because of that, he has some kidney dysfunction. He goes on dialysis, and he's added about 15 more medications while in the hospital for about a month. Goes to a long-term acute care hospital for about two more months, and he comes out you know, on 15 medications, and he's uh, excited about the benefits of his Obamacare that took care of all of his conditions problem. What did they not do? The they didn't take the vice grip out. Now, this is simply like a very simple, silly analogy. The problem is this is how we practice medicine. This is exactly what we do day in and day out every day of the year. Hundreds of thousands of patients are going in with a vice grip on their thumb and the doctor does not remove the vice grip. We're simply adding medication after medication, treating side effect after side effect, and we ignore the vice grip on the thumb. That's the problem we have. Thanks for that question. Mm -hmm. One last thing for me. Do we have? No, no. <laughs> yes. well, well, no, no, no. We've got we to this, but this is about the game changers. And man, there's a lot of emphasis on getting men to uh, change. And one of the one of the more compelling or intriguing aspects of this, the film was a, an experiment in which it showed that men who ate uh, red meat were, um, their sexual performance was a lot more than if they ate a veggie meal. And sometimes when people hear this, I mean, they, they, they hook men up to see what they do at night and then they sleep and it goes up down. And it's a big difference. Some people laugh about that, but some people say, well, this could be a big, have a big effect on men. Do you? Do you all think that? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> maybe, maybe there is just a big. <laughs> maybe this is. Um, some people just squeamish about it. You know, people say, "Well, why should that be a big motivator?" Uh, and what about women? If uh, just because the man feels, you know, 
a natural Viagra type thing. Not broccoli, but spinach. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm just wondering if that seems to, would, does that have the kind of, does that sound like breakthrough? Anybody. Yeah. I, yeah. Yeah, when we see a, a patient, a typically I see a man comes in and say, well, what brings you here today? He said, well, my, my wife wants me to come and get checked out. I know that that's often an issue that's being dealt with. So so it could be a game changer in the relationship, but but I think you're right. It's, it's something that uh, is an important factor and a part of men's health, uh, but a part of all of us. I mean, and, you know, women have sexual dysfunction as well when they're eating a Healthy diet. So, so those are the. They don't want to <laughs> well, well, lack, of, lack of desire, uh, 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 inability to get moist, and all those types of things, or so vaginal dryness. And so, there's a, a variety of things that happen with women. Bring uh, on the salads, right? Yeah, that's right. Bring on the salads. That's right. So. Those electric, those electric spinach That's right. That's right. So, anyway. I want to go ask for a round of applause for that. your dinner please tip, rem remember to tip your server um, we have a the servers the tips go to the whole staff here so that really helps us thank you did you want to add anything no no i'm good okay. yeah. <laughs> But yeah, just thank you very much. You've been a wonderful audience, great uh, questions. And, and, and what I'd like to I, I say to uh, every group that I talk to is that um, I like to think of uh, enlisting you as part of the group. I think all of you are already part of the, the movement. Uh, if you're not, if you don't consider yourself as part of the movement, consider yourself part of the movement. What you will do in your life and your lifestyle changes will save multiple lives, not only yours, it will enhance other people's lives. And there are people whom you know who are seeing you, but there are also people whom you don't know who are watching you, watching the things that you do. So be steadfast, be aggressive. Whatever challenge you have, force yourself to go beyond and do it because it's going to have a favorable impact on your life and you're going to save someone else's life as well. So thank you very much. Thank you.